this is my life story, Omi's life story. It begins with my childhood. Papi and Mutti got married July 15th, 1932. They knew each other since childhood. Two years later, I was born. I grew up surrounded by a ton of love. Papi had started his taxi business before and Oma was helping him. The time came when she didn't want to participate anymore and thought it was time for him to get married. Papi, Oma and Opa were born on the island of Rügen in the Baltic Sea, Mutti in Mecklenburg. Her mother died in childbirth. She was raised by her aunt in the farm country. The Baltic Sea meant everything to my family. Every summer they would vacation in one of the well-known resorts and there were also many visits to relatives and friends. One funny story was often told when I was three years old. We went to the resort Gören. Oma stayed home to take care of the business, but Opa came with us. The beaches were all lined up with Strandkörbe, which translates into beach baskets. The vacationers rented them for the time of their visits. Opa and Mutti wanted to take a walk, but Papi wanted to read and stayed behind in the Strandkorb and was supposed to watch me. I must have gotten bored and wandered on my own along the beach. When Papi discovered I was gone, he got frantic. From far he could make out that people were gathering around something. When he got closer, he noticed the color red shining through. It was my dress. People were trying to find out where I lived. All I could tell them was that I lived in a Strandkorb. So everybody got a good laugh and I assume Papi learned a valuable lesson. That reminds me, Jeff did the same at Lake Welch in New York. We were, sitting, we were setting up a playpen and chairs. All of a sudden he was gone. I ran to look for him and two young girls came towards me holding his hands, looking for his parents. I guess he started early to make contact with the opposite sex. When I was almost four years old, Honey was born. It came very sudden. I don't remember ever being told that I would soon have a sister or brother. I was at Oma and Opa's. They lived at that time in another street. Somebody came to take me home and I was told I had a little sister. I recall that it took a long time until I could hold her. They probably didn't trust me. When they thought the time was right, I had to sit down and Oma gave her to me. I think I was very proud at that moment to have a little sister. Even so, I wanted always a brother who should be older than me, which wasn't possible anymore. Honey became a real doll mother when she got older and I was more the tomboy. It was constantly mentioned that I would take over one day the taxi business and attend business school in Stralsund. Both never happened, but a businesswoman I became and managed a small drogery and later a larger one. Also worked the photo lab and enjoyed decorating as well. Another funny story. Papi smoked cigars at that time and sent me often to the neighborhood store to pick up an order. They gave me a cigar box and I left the store. Had to cross a larger bridge over a creek and thought, I don't need another cigar box. I have so many at home. Let's see how it will float and over the railing it went. Then I realized they didn't give me the cigars. Went back to the store and was told they had been in the box they gave me. I started to cry, told them the cigars were floating in the Mühlgraben and went home, still crying and screaming and ran upstairs to Oma. End of story, I was not punished. They all had probably a good laugh. The son of the store owner then ran down to the creek and fished out the cigar box. World War II started in 1938. I think Papi was drafted in 1940. All our automobiles were confiscated. We were reimbursed, but not for the real value. 
Papi was trained in a boot camp in Stettin. Later he was in France, Poland and Russia, but always at the Werkzeug Repair Company. He would come home sometimes on furlough. Honey was always hiding behind the big chair. She didn't know him anymore. By the time he left, she got close to him again. We had enough to eat and wear. Even so, things were rationed. We raised rabbits and chickens. Relatives with farms would provide for us. We even played war games. When people from Ostpreußen and Hinterpommern had to leave their land and homes, large tracks would come through our city. They came with horses and large wagons. Sometimes whole villages trekked together and parked in our street. Nearby were stables for their horses. All people in our city opened their homes to give shelter. We also had Flüchtlinge staying in our house. We children made a game out of this tragic event. Opa had a large pull wagon, which we used often for our garden. We girls would sit in it with our dolls and the boys would pull us. We even covered the wagon with blankets. We were auf der Flucht. Auf der Flucht means... We were on the go. Yes, we were fleeing from somewhere. April 1945, the day the Russian troops marched into our city. A block away from our street was a bank building. The bank manager lived above the offices and a custodian below. There was also a very large basement in the building where all the neighbors took shelter when we got warning of airstrikes. Luckily for us, they flew always over us and unloaded somewhere else. There was not much industry or other important points in and around our city. But now the Russian troops came closer and we were all taking shelter in the basement of the bank building. We could hear a lot of noises and commotion from large vehicles and tanks. Certain kind of tanks. Yeah. But no shooting. Some man and the manager of the bank went upstairs and hung a large white sheet from the balcony to show the invaders that there was no resistance. Soon after the first Russians entered the basement, they went from person to person with open hands, demanding Uri, Uri, and everybody gave their watches. Opa was very fond of his pocket watch and had to give it up <laughs> with a bleeding heart. <laughs> Years later, Papi gave him another. We all then went back to our homes, scared of what would happen next. Muddy had sewed little backpacks for Honey and me with our names on and a larger suitcase was always ready for her. These things were in our living room on the first floor. We were all upstairs at Oma and Opa's after we came back to our house. A Russian soldier of higher rank came into the room. He was very friendly and tried to talk to us. He spoke some German words. He lifted up Honey, trying to tell us he had little children too. I think Honey wasn't too happy about the attention too. My mother was standing next to the window and saw a soldier walking out of the house with our backpacks and suitcase. She pulled the friendly Russian to the window and pointed to the one taking off with our belongings. He opened the window, spoke to him, and our things were returned. After we were all alone, the soldier who was told to return the things came back to the house. We still were upstairs. He walked up and pointed a gun at us around the door frame. We ran screaming into the kitchen, but there was no way to escape. Mutti and Oma tried to calm us. After a while, nothing happened. The soldier was gone. Opa went downstairs and saw him on his knees in our living room, working on his gun. Much later, we found out that this type of gun, it had a round barrel or magazine on the side, was a dysfunctional weapon at many times. Opa thought at this point, 
we should all leave the house. We tiptoed down the stairs and ran to a neighbor's house. We were afraid and didn't want to go back to the house. Later, Mutti went back with a neighbor to retrieve our backpacks and suitcases. We went then to friends of our grandparents and spent the night in their cellar. The door was hidden. That was a night when soldiers were looking for women. We were four children and four women. It was a scary night, but we made it. Little Dieter was still getting his bottle. Each time he would make a noise, Tante Lotte would hold the bottle to his mouth. We would hear all night heavy boots walking above the floor. Opa and his friend were upstairs. The morning came and it was decided we had to leave our city. It would be not safe to stay another night. Tante Lotte, Waltraud and Dieter lived in Tuto, about 20 kilometers away from Demin. They had been staying with their grandparents, Opa and Opa's, Oma and Opa's friends. Tuto had at that time a very well tarnished airport for the military. Perhaps they thought it would be safer for them to stay in Demin by their grandparents. So plans were made for us all to go to Tutu and see if it was now safe to stay in their house for a while. But we needed our four-wheel large hand wagon for this journey to load some of our belongings on. We went back to the house and left later in the day with Binkes. We were two men, four women and four children. The younger children, six and three years old, would get once in a while a ride on the wagon. I was almost 11 and had to walk. Before, I got, before it got dark, we stopped at a farmhouse and asked for shelter. We all slept in the barn and had a safe night. The next morning we left for Tuto. I remember that Oma came to my rescue and insisted that I would get a ride on the wagon too. I never forgot that. Tante Lotte's house in Tuto was in order. We stayed there for a few days. We were short on food but never went hungry. Opa decided to go back to Demin to see if it was safe to go home and if our house was not burned down. He went by bicycle which was taken from him and he had to walk. Opa came back with good news. Our house was still standing, not occupied by soldiers, but it was high time to return before we were completely robbed. One third of our city was burned down. The apotheca familia was considered to belong to the higher society. They had invited the high ranks of the Russian military for dinner and poisoned them, including themselves. Because of this incident, the soldiers were given 24 hours plünderungsfreiheit, which meant they could do whatever they wanted with our city. We had left already when this happened. Many people took their lives by jumping in the rivers, mothers tied together with their children, one classmate of mine lost her life together with her sister that way, and the mother was pulled out of the water and survived. Her name was Krista Foss. I never forgot. My girlfriend's mother was lost and never found again. Their grandmother stayed with her and her sister. The mother's coat was found later, but nobody ever found out what had happened to her. We children understood this tragedy only years later. Our church stood like a monument. Whole blocks around her were burned to the ground. Our street and the next block were spared. We were never bombed, but when the end of the war came, we were all bleeding. the escape route of my father from Russia to our hometown. Whenever Papi told this story to family and friends, he always had a captivated audience. After 65 years, I'm writing down what I remember, regretting so very much not having him around 
to ask more questions. The Second World War had ended in May 1945. Papi was on the Eastern Front in Russia, around Smolensk, taking prisoner with his company. He belonged to a Werkstatt company, which means a repair commando for vehicles right behind the troops fighting at the front. He and his comrades had to work now for the Russians. Papi had a good relationship with many because he was a very knowledgeable and a good craftsman. His goal was from the beginning to escape and start his journey home. One day a Russian who had become a friend and knew of his plans told him that the entire camp would be transferred to Siberia and when he wanted to escape he had to be, it had to be soon. Papi replied positive to the news but said he could not leave without his passport which was kept with all the others in the office. So the first step began. At noontime the office closed, some friends watched outside and he managed to get into the building and found his passport. The next step was getting a reference in Russian from somebody, maybe a superior, which could be useful on his journey and turned later out to be just that when he had reached the end of his destination. With these important things and some food supplies from friends on all sides, he escaped. His goal was to reach the mean mecklenburg vorpommern close to his wedding anniversary, but there were many miles in between. The route went through Poland, Ostpreußen, Hinterpommern, Stettin, Demin. My estimation is he left about the end of May or beginning of June and his wedding anniversary was July 15th. Papi met another soldier on his trip, but they stayed together only for a short time. They walked during the night and slept during the day, most of the time in deserted homes or cellars, in which they probably also found conserved food. At one point, they had to cross a waterway. Two men rowed a boat and brought people to the other side. Two women were also waiting at the crossing. After they all boarded the boat and had paid for the crossing, suspicion set in. Puppy and his companion had paid with money which came from an area known to be a part of a very tragic battleground. The men considered them the enemy. They steered the boat into thick reeds and wanted to shoot Puppy and his companion. The two women fell on their knees, prayed and begged for their life of the two men to let them go. Papi often gave those women all the credit for saving their lives. They were God's tools. Sometimes they jumped on trains going west and got a little further without walking. Then came the time to part. Everybody went in another direction. Papi finally reached Stettin on the Oder, which now separates Germany from Poland. All territory east of the Oder was given to Poland, and Russia took a lot of land from Poland. This was a decision between President Roosevelt and Stalin. It was never put to a vote. By now Papi had grown a beard and was wearing a Baskenmütze which gave him a bit of a French look, like a French beret. He was 38 years old and probably looked like a grandpa. He arrived in Stettin, which is about 100 kilometer from Demin. Tired on his feet, he sat down on the side of the street. A little boy approached, calling him Opa which was no compliment. He replied that he was too young to be an opa. The boy excused himself, judging him as one by his looks. They started to talk. The boy was very inquisitive and wanted to know where Papi was going. Papi was reluctant to talk too much about his plans, but the boy wasn't so easy satisfied. When he mentioned Demin was his destination, the boy got excited, telling him that he just came from there. He was now on his way with his people wanting to go back to their homes in Hinterpommern or even Ostpreußen. 
The boy wanted to know where Papi lived when he told him Kirchhofstraße and said you probably wouldn't know where that is. Oh yes, the boy replied. On the corner at the other side is a brewery and there is a Ziegenbock on top of the roof, which was the sign for the beer brewery. <laughs> now Papi knew that the boy was sent to him to give him hope and courage to continue his journey. The boy assured him that even one third of the city was burned, this part was not. So I am sure Papi couldn't wait to start on the rest of his trip home. Hohenbolten is about 14 kilometer from Demin. Mutti's cousin lived there on their large farm with her family. Papi reached their homestead, walking down a narrow path toward their house. They spotted him and thought another Russian came down to look for women or wanted to plunder them. Then the big surprise, it was Puppy. The closer Puppy came to home, the more assurance he received that we were all alive and well. Tante Lisa from Hohenbolten had been in touch with us recently. The final day of his arrival, home came. We had been in our garden at the outskirt of our city and came home late afternoon. The Russians still kept coming, sometimes in our houses, so the door was quickly locked as soon as we were all home. Only this time we forgot to lock the door. Mutti, Honey and I were sitting at the kitchen table having our supper. I still get tears <laughs> in my eyes after 65 years. The door opens and a man with a beard and wearing a French beret enters our kitchen. I was very, very scared and looked at my mother for protection. She suddenly screams, Papi, 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 and runs towards him. I took another look and recognized him too. All three of us put our arms around him. Right after this emotional moment, two Russian soldiers entered the kitchen. They had seen Puppy entering the house, wanting to know who he was and what he was doing there. Now the reference note from his Russian friend at the prison camp saved us all from another separation. They asked if this was Puppy's home and family, and after reading the note, they left. Now we locked the door, and nothing could separate us. We all were united in July 1945. Several of our schools were also burned to the ground. The oldest one survived. We had wonderful teachers, mostly. They were eager for us to get started with schooling. We gathered first at a sawmill. The owner made space to be used as a classroom, at least for a while. Our English teacher had first found a place for her class in the attic of a large family house. Slowly all went back to normal, but because we had less schools for all the children to attend in the morning, there was also school in the afternoon. We took turns with the boys. Our system separated the girls from the boys, each had their own class. After fourth grade, I was enrolled in the Hauptschule. We all learned English. I still remember my first lesson of English. I loved to learn the language from day one. When our teacher, Fräulein Enke, entered the classroom, she started to talk only English, and we sat there like little dummies. Soon it became a lot of fun. Since we kept her as our class teacher till the end of the school years, she was able to continue teaching us English. Even so, the whole system changed. We were now Volksschule till the 8th grade. From there on, one would take the academic level for four more years or choose an education which offered on the job training for three years and attending a business class once a week. After three years, we would graduate if one didn't pass the tests had to be repeated or one never would be considered a full-fledged professional. It was very, very difficult to find jobs. 
where you would be trained for three years. The only places who were willing to train was as a beautician, a salesperson, or any office worker. I didn't like any of these. One day I saw an advertisement in the window of a drogery, which is similar to a drugstore. They were looking for somebody to train and send to school for three years. I knew that moment what I wanted. My father went over to talk to Mr. Schultz. I had to appear in person and was hired. The only problem was my school year wasn't over until April and it was January. But they needed somebody now. So I got special permission from my teacher and the director of schools and started my training in February for the next three years. There was a training school far away. I had to travel by train once a week and later we stayed once a month for one week and had accommodations in a building for university students. In my hometown I had to attend business school for three years. In the beginning I thought I wouldn't be able to learn all what was expected from me and cried often at night. But I didn't want to disappoint my family and teacher, so I studied and made good grades. I always loved what I did. We also had a photo lab to work in there, gave me great joy. I graduated in March of 1952. December of 1951, the year puppy had to leave for West Germany. After the war, there were no automobiles available, so puppy opened up a repair shop for motorcycles and bicycles. It was a lucrative business, only parts were very difficult to come by. Puppy would travel by train to Berlin and brought back what he could of needed parts. These purchases were made mostly in the west side of Berlin, which was occupied by the English, Americans and French. Soon it was forbidden for us, living under the Russian occupation, to do business with the west. Supply in the east was never enough. Puppy tried still to get parts. His people needed work and the customers their bicycles. There were friends who helped him one locomotive Führer would buy the parts in Berlin and bring them back on the train where Papi would meet him at the train station in our city and the parts would be exchanged. No bills were supposed to accompany the delivery. One day he waited at the train station and the friend was not on the train. They had caught him. He had carried all the receipts with him. It was now only a matter of time till the police would catch up with Puppy. He had friends in the police force. One came and told him that the next day he would be asked to appear at the station. That meant they would keep him and prosecute. There were stiff penalties for breaking the law. A friend brought him to a train station in the next town. From there he went to West Berlin and asked for asylum. We were subjected from now on to interrogations and other unfriendly treatments. Oma and Opa had to move out of their apartment into a much smaller one in our house. Luckily, very good friends moved into theirs. We had actually no rights in our house anymore. After I graduated from my job, the Drogistenfachschule and the business school, I stayed on and was now the only breadwinner. In 1953, it was decided that Mutti, Honey and I would follow Papi over Berlin into the West. Papi was by now living in Wetterruhe in Westfalen and had a good job. It was very hard for Oma and Opa. They had to stay behind. I had made up my mind and wanted to stay with them, but Mutti insisted that I came too, otherwise she wouldn't leave. I knew she couldn't bear to be without Papi then I gave in. The full impact of this move for us all came much later. Honey left a day before us. A friend brought her to West Berlin. Mutti and I went the next day. My feeling was one day I would return, enriched with knowledge in every field. I did once for Oma's funeral. 
return in 1957 and the second time in 1991 with Adi and Honey. It was very touching, but what was once dear and near to me was all gone. I was able to get together with old friends from school. Our house was still standing, but later torn down and rebuilt. The most peaceful feeling came over me when we went through the gate of the cemetery to visit Omas and Opa's gravesite. And old friends once. Wetterruhe 1953 till 1956. Our newfound home was now in Wetter, a pretty little town in a beautiful setting on a lake and mountain. I found employment in a drogery and worked also the photo lab. But everything was so different the merchandise, the setup. In the mean, the store was more refined. I was never happy there. Of course, it took some time till I got to know the different merchandise. Honey and I went one year to the Siegerland on vacation. I liked that part of the land much better and started to look into another employment. That is how the Siegerland became my home. I met wonderful people, was very happy at my job and was soon managing a small drogery and a bit later a larger one. These were very fulfilling years for me. I joined a hiking club and friendships were formed which still exists today. I grew those years. They were my best between 1956 and 1960 as a single young person with happy dreams. Then Adi came into my life. He lived in Los Angeles, belonged to a German club which had arranged an overseas trip to Germany. Everybody went to Germany on their own. We saw each other for the first time in the Siegerland and spent a lot of time together. I took my vacation and showed him the beautiful Siegerland. We then went together to Wetter where Adi met my parents and Honey. He still hadn't visited his mother in Bremen Seckenhausen, so he went from Wetter to see her and came back shortly. In this time we grew together and felt strong enough wanting to get married, so we got engaged. Adi had to return to Los Angeles and I was supposed to come the following year. Our plans didn't work out the way we wanted. I got discouraged and didn't want to go to the States anymore. I wanted him to prove his love and come back to Germany. In the meantime, Stefan was born and I was living in Wetter with my parents. Adi came in September. We got married. He found a job at Rutgers and also a small apartment in Hagen. We were happy to be together, but Adi wasn't happy with his job and had thoughts of going back to the States. Papi helped him financially to return to New York. Adi found a good job, rented a house for us all in Yonkers, and in October of 1962, Stefan and I came to New York. The house was beautiful. We had a large backyard. Adi was a good provider. He always made me feel so secure, was full of love and generous with compliments. I was really never homesick. Only on holidays I missed my parents and honey. 1963, Jeff was born. In May, Tante Honey came for a visit. Jeff felt so comfortable when in her arms and fell always asleep. We all enjoyed our backyard at Seminary Avenue in Yonkers. 1964, Mutti came to visit and enjoyed her two grandsons. Adi was always the tour guide when New York City was on the program. I stayed behind with the children. Jeff felt only comfortable at home so I never saw the city. But that changed when Papi came in 1966. I finally saw the city, Statue of Liberty, Empire State Building, and a few other points of interest with Papi together, which made his visit very special for me. Radney was born in 1965. He was satisfied wherever we went and would fall asleep everywhere we put him down. Even coming home from short trips in later years, Ratni sat on my lap and by the time we arrived at home, he was asleep. Our three boys were a good team and never a problem. 
Stefan always felt as a protector, mostly to Rodney. Jeff got very independent. Tante Yuli lived upstairs in the house and became a part of our family. Stefan was her favorite. Many times he waited for her at the door when she came home from her job in the city. She was employed in a Thai factory. We took her along on all our outings. She sold many things for the boys, which was a great help to me. Each time Jeff would ride his tricycle, she always complained he would come close to her, but she loved our boys anyway. Tante Emma and Uncle Frank, our next-door neighbors, became also very close to us. The children loved them dearly. Emma became, for me, my adopted mother. She was that time, and also later on, my best friend. When Uncle Frank died years later, Jeff took it very hard. He waited outside when we went to the funeral home, but later walked in by himself and sat with us. When we went the next day to the cemetery, they were all fine and were pointing out future resting places for us. In 1968, we bought our first house and moved to Rockland County. A big step for us all and a good one too. The backyard was big and a wonderful play yard. 1969, Adi opened his own body shop, first in the newly built two-car garage, from where he started to work for a dealership, and later it became conventional auto body in Valley Cottage. He rented the large building for five years and bought it later. 1984, we sold the building with all the equipment and Dad retired. A cold winter followed, and we were thinking of moving to a warmer climate. After traveling to Florida and exploring the west coast, south and north, we decided to build a house in Spring Hill, River Country. It was a new development, only a few years old. Dad got his dream house in a beautiful one-acre setting. 1985, we moved. We traveled a lot, made friends, many of them, and were happy. The first three years I missed my boys very much and the many, many old friends we had made for the, over the years, which had become like family to us all. We had many visitors in our new beautiful home. 1988, Dad needed a triple bypass. Everything went well and he recovered. Garden work was getting harder and harder for him to do. We knew that one acre property and the big house were getting too big for us to maintain. Adi procrastinated. 1995, we had found a buyer for our house and bought a beautiful villa on a small lot in Glen Lakes. I was happy there from the minute we moved in. It took Dad a little longer. He was still thinking big. We still lived an active life, had gatherings with our friends from the German club and others from River Country, also visited friends in New York and in Germany. May 25, 2003, Stefan passed away. Unexpectedly on a Sunday, Stefan wasn't feeling good all weekend and had called 9-11. They brought him to the nearest hospital but he never let Jeff and Rodney know. We all knew Stefan had a heart problem. Nobody could convince him to see a doctor. Toward the end, his boss finally was able to change his mind, but it came too late. Stefan died of heart failure. We were told after an autopsy that it surprised everybody that he had lived to be almost 42 years old with such a condition. Our hearts were broken. I was devastated by the thought that he was all alone in his last hour. Only when he appeared to me in a dream, I was able to let him go and found acceptance. Our neighbors and friends were very caring. For a long time, they made sure I didn't go alone on my walks. Jeff and Rodney read beautiful eulogies at Stefan's memorial service. The church was filled. 
His friends gave him another service when we brought the ashes to Fire Island, the place where he found for many years much happiness and spent many summers. Stefan was always a happy person and kept every problem to himself. He was easy to please. His memory is on our hearts. Adi developed more health problems than others. He needed a pacemaker and after a number of years another replacement. Psychotic delusions also set in and brought very sad times into our lives. Jeff and Radni tried to help with no results. There was one session with a psychiatrist and a woman consultant. Both analyzed the problem immediately, but Adi was obsessed with his ways of thinking and convinced they were real. Even his best friends couldn't make him see that his thoughts would go wild. Many times I reached the end of my rope, but each time I prayed for help, it came. So I knew that God wanted me to stay on and help Adi. God would be there to give me the strength. The last three years of Dad's life were a struggle for him. He had COPD and needed often help to breathe. First it was the puffer or the neutralizer, and for the last year, a concentrator, many times during the night. I took over the driving. Several times he was hospitalized. There was one emergency on a Sunday when I came home from church. He was lying on the kitchen floor, incoherent. Turned out it was dehydration, so they said. Saturday, the 14th of February, Dad was very tired and rested. I was invited by my neighbor to attend a fashion show at her church and had left a prepared lunch for him. I was very restless and couldn't wait to get home. On the kitchen table was still his lunch and there were two beautiful potted blooming orchids. Dad had no appetite and Miss Jean had bought the orchids at his request for me because it was Valentine's Day on Sunday. Even so, he wasn't able to buy flowers by himself. He arranged to have something for me. These orchids have become a symbol for me. The year is June 2010, and they are still blooming since January for the second time. And today is June 2011, and they are still blooming. <laughs> The next day, a Sunday, Dad got worse. Everything pointed to heart failure. I called the doctor in the morning. He wanted him in the hospital, but Adi didn't want to go. In the evening, it got worse. I called the doctor again, and he insisted we call the ambulance, which I did. Jean came over and helped to get dressed. Helped Adi to get dressed. Both of us followed the ambulance. After several tests, it was clear he had to stay. There was fluid in his lungs and heart. I had brought Jean home before. The doctor told me I should go home too. There was no reason for me to stay, since Dad would be assigned soon to a room. Monday there were a lot of tests for Dad. Tuesday while I was there, we thought he would have a stroke and was admitted into ICU after evaluation. He appeared to have overcome again. Wednesday I wanted to leave for the hospital early afternoon, but changed my mind and went before. When I entered his room, he had difficult breathing and asked if I had brought his puffer. I replied that we should wait and see if the oxygen could be increased. The nurse was with him and putting the mask on him. He was very restless. I was holding his hand. Suddenly he turned his head to the right, closed his eyes and took his last breath. The monitor was still showing a reading, but the nurse assured me it was the pacemaker. Dad had slipped away. My greatest comfort was that I was granted to be with him and holding his hand. Dr. Osman came later, 
So did Jean and Kathy and Pastor Wien, which was for me the ultimate service we could do for him. Jean was at my side all the time. She helped with every decision I had to make. Kathy and Jean didn't want me to drive home, but I assured them I was in control. They followed me and were convinced that that was the case. After cremation, a week later, I picked Dad up by myself. I was calm and brought him home. We had to wait till March 12 with the memorial service, since I wanted to rent the fellowship hall too. A lot of friends attended. Jeff and Radney at my side made me feel proud and secure. Their eulogies were well received. After they left for home, my world caved in, but my friends made sure I didn't feel alone. They were and still are the best friends one could have. While I was in weather staying with Honey, the writing of my life story came easy. She could fill in things I didn't remember and I wasn't distracted. After one year without Adi, I also have adjusted. I got involved with many things, volunteer work at church, making new friends and inviting them often. Most of them are widows and grew up in Germany too. Our discussions over coffee and cake or dinner are always lively and interesting. We lift each other up. Crocheting blankets in the evening for the youth shelter is my greatest therapy. I feel comfort all around me. I am so very glad having made the decision to visit family and friends in Germany but Jeff and Radney encouraged me. I was first reluctant to go. My heart is overflowing many times from the love and care everybody is showing me. I also felt this trip should be a thank you to people who helped me to grow, gave me courage and wisdom, were there when I needed them the most and gave me lasting friendship, which so far existed for more than 50 years. This was documented in, on June 3rd, 2011. <laughs> Thank you, Rob.